To fallen soldiers let us sing. Where no rockets fly, nor bullets wing, our broken brothers let us bring to the mansions of the Lord. No more bleeding, no more fight, no prayers pleading through the night, just divine embrace, eternal light, in the mansions of the Lord. Where no mothers cry and no children weep, we will stand and guard though the angels sleep. All through the ages safely keep the mansions of the Lord. When no mothers cry and no children weep, we will stand and guard though the angels sleep. All through the ages safely keep the mansions of the Lord. another of our Sunday morning messages. We're so glad that you have chosen to gather together with your family and to spend time in the Word. We encourage you to take uh, some special time afterward to discuss the message with one another and to share your insights uh, so that you have opportunity to add the blessings. Uh, we're going to speak evangelistically today. Uh, we're going to pretend we're a mega church, and we have all these satellite churches all throughout the area, and you're our satellites. But we are looking forward to getting back together again and continue to gather information and consult sources to find out whether or not they finally have decided what they're really doing. But once we get some solid answers, we'll get information to you. With that, I'm going to ask you to bow with me for a moment of prayer, and then our service will begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for meeting with us today. 
We thank you, Father, that no matter how far apart we may be, that you are with us, each and every one. And so, Father, as we look to your word today, as we take this opportunity to worship, we pray, Father, that your blessings would be upon us, and this time would be profitable to us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. you bow with me, please, before the message. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, God, that you have not left us without understanding, but have provided through your prophets your wisdom and your knowledge that we may better understand our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his work. We pray now you'd open our minds and hearts as we look to your word in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Last week's key passage focused on two commands, the second of which is the better known, be holy for I am holy. The lesser known and primary command actually precedes this and is the principal command in this passage because it encompasses the foundation of Peter's thought. We read in verse 13, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Herein we saw the significance of hope to living for Christ in this day and age. This morning, we'll move on to Peter's second admonition and the second reason why we have hope in this age. And that is a central thought that may seem a little odd at first. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. That said, I ask you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 25, which is our complete text for this morning. 
And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Peter begins this section with a supposition. If you call on the Father. In this context, the Father is first and foremost the holy God who commands us to be holy, for I am holy. And this adds special significance to the fact that Peter here defines the Father as the God who without partiality judges according to each man's work. Now, judges is a familiar Greek verb, krino, and it means to divide or to cut sharply. By extension, it is to distinguish between good and evil. God's judgment is also defined here as being without partiality. This is the Greek word aprosopaleptos. It is a negation of the same word used in James chapter 2 to describe hypocrisy, or literally accepting a face. Thus we read in James chapter 2, verse 9, But if you show partiality, you commit sin, and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now James illustrates this with the example of those who gave the rich man the best seat and sent the poor man to sit on a footstool. And so we see here a contrast between men who judge by appearance, and God calls this hypocrisy, and God who judges on the basis of a man's thoughts, words, and deeds. It is God's holy judgment in mind that Peter admonishes us to conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Now, the word conduct yourselves, or anastrepho, is a verb form of a word used previously. In fact, in 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16, where we read, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Conduct yourselves is a command that is reflected back upon the individual. This intensifies the use of the word and would be better translated, you conduct yourselves. This conduct is finally defined in the context of our stay here in the world as paroikia, or literally sojourners. Again, sojourners are people who live in a foreign land, but who are not citizens of that land. We are in the world but we are not of the world, and so we are the outsiders who are living temporarily this short time in a sinful world. We are citizens of heaven, and as such represent our God and King, who has called us to be holy in all our conduct and judges each man's work without partiality. These thoughts are intertwined back and forth throughout this entire passage. And for all these reasons and more, Peter admonishes us to conduct ourselves in our sojourning here in fear. Now herein I'm reminded of the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, where he writes, Therefore, 
Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, both apostles use the same word, phobeo, and from this we get our word, phobia. The root meaning is to flee or to retreat. It generally means to terrify or to frighten. But in the Old Testament, we see several shifts in its meaning. First, meaning to fear, to be terrified, then to tremble and quake in respect, and finally, reverence when used toward God. And as we look at the nature of this marvelous salvation that is ours, we see all three of these elements. Now, having admonished us regarding how to live, Peter now offers motivation for godly living in this world. And again, each thought is built on the thought before it. To that end, look back with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 19, to see the context of this motivation. If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Why? Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Knowing is the Greek word oida, and there are several words that are translated no. This particular word means to understand or gain knowledge through first-hand personal experience. We're to conduct ourselves in a godly knowledge, in a godly manner, with the knowledge that we have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Now, it has been often said by people that the only value something has is what someone is willing to give to it. And in that context, I would argue that this is only true from the perspective of the one who is willing to pay the price. Others may not give the same value to that. It is the one who is willing to pay the price who really sets the value, at least in his own mind. And I'd like you to think about Jesus' parable in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, where he said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, to the farmer, the field in question might be worth $1,000 an acre. And the reason for that, his, he intends to plant a crop on that field, and then to harvest that crop, and then to sell it. A developer looks at that same field, and he values it at $5,000 an acre because he intends to build homes on that ground and then to sell each of those homes. Yet knowing the true value of the hidden treasure, would you not also give all that you have to obtain it and, more importantly, to keep it? And if that treasure were a soul, we see that Christ was willing to shed his blood, and to give himself to redeem us from our sins. We are, in that context, the treasure that is worth more than anything else. And our motivation to live holy lives then becomes the value that we place on the shed blood of Christ. And in that context, Peter establishes another important contrast in verses 18 and 19. We read, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. I want you to think back to the Roman Empire, where slaves were bought with silver and gold perishable commodities whose only value is based on their scarcity. The less you have, 
the more valuable something is. But if you were in a desert with a ton of gold and had no water and were dying of thirst, would you not give up all that gold for that proverbial cup of cold water? Of what value, then, is the blood of the only begotten Son of God who poured it out for us to buy us out of the slavery of sin? And know this also before you answer, that Christ is the only one who could redeem us from our sin. His blood is the only blood, the only payment sufficient to redeem us. Peter himself declared in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Seeing the significance, the value of Christ, the significance of his shed blood. I want you to take you back to 1 Peter 1, 20 through 21, where we shift our focus to Christ himself. 1 Peter 1, 20. He that is, it, that is Christ indeed was foreordained or foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was manifest, revealed in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Foreordained in verse 20 is really the word prognosco, and it literally means to know beforehand. In this case, translated, having been known before. We see a parallel thought in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, where we read, The mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. What was known before the foundation of the world was only revealed in the passage of time. And this word prognosco is found in another passage in the New Testament, Romans 8, 29, where it is properly translated for new. But in this case, it is speaking to those who are redeemed by Christ rather than speaking of Christ. Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. This passage is significant as well because Paul tells us that it is and always was God's purpose that we would be conformed to Christ. Now understand, he knew before the world was created who would believe. That is foreknowledge. That is not predestined, simply foreknown. And this passage is significant because it tells us that it is God's purpose that we would be conformed. We who he knew would believe would ultimately be shaped like Christ. So the foreknowledge of Christ is contrasted by pre Peter to another word, phanerao, to manifest, to reveal, to make known, to bring to light, to disclose. Remember how the prophets struggled as bits and pieces of new information were given to them, trying to fit it all together to understand what God was ultimately planning, what he was ultimately pointing to. And then we come to the time of Christ, where Christ himself is manifested. He is revealed. And so the puzzle is, in a manner of speaking, completed, put together. And so as we look back to this earlier text in First Peter, we see three things. First of all, Christ was known in eternity past. Secondly, he was prophesied time and again throughout the Old Testament. And finally, he was revealed in these last times to us. Those bits and pieces, those tiny bits of information are now brought together and revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And herein we look to our motivation to live godly lives, 
to see God the Son in the flesh as our example in the words of Hebrews chapter 4, 14 and 15. Paul writes, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. The manifestation of God the Son in the flesh, living, dying, rising from the dead, ascending to the Father, had purpose in our lives and to our faith. We read in 1 Peter 1, 21, that he was manifested for us in the last days, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Through his life on this earth, Christ has given us the assurance that he is in fact God the Son. He is in fact the Redeemer. And so this strengthens our hope. Peter is not speaking to the lost who have neither faith nor hope, but to the saints, admonishing us to rest our hope fully, completely, perfectly upon the grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter is not speaking to those who do not believe in Christ, do not believe that he was crucified, do not believe that he was risen, but to we who do believe so that our faith would be in Christ in Christ alone. We are saved by grace through faith. We are kept by grace. It is God who provided salvation through Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ manifested, revealed all of this to us. It's God who preserves us through the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells us. And so we come to this conclusion of this passage. We see again how Peter adds precept upon precept upon precept, bringing forth to us, first of all, this admonition that we are to live in fear. Secondly, that we have our hope and our faith in Christ because he has been manifested to us. And so we come to the conclusion of this portion of 1 Peter. In 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Now, as we begin to look at this portion more closely, we see the word purify, and this is the Greek word hagnizo. It means to purify, to cleanse, to consecrate, and it was used particularly in reference to the Old Testament tabernacle and eventually to the temple and all of the things that were part of that. But used metaphorically, it means to render pure in a moral or a spiritual sense. And in this particular text, this portion would be literally translated in this way. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth through the Spirit unto sincere brotherly love. Now note here, purification of the souls is not the end purpose. It is a prerequisite for something greater. It is the basis for this brotherly love. On our part, 
we must hear and act upon the truth. That's what this word believes. We hear what God wants of us, then we must follow that. On God's part, His Spirit enables us to do so. And herein, I'm reminded of the words of Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, where he confesses of himself, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. And so like Paul, we must depend upon the Holy Spirit to accomplish or to enable us to accomplish what is our heart's desire in Christ. Paul said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so as we look at this phrase, brotherly love, which is the Greek word Philadelphia, we understand that this is a work of the spirit. This is part of what God has accomplished in us in this work of salvation, and as such, is an evidence of salvation. Look with me at 1 John three fourteen, where he writes, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Now understand, this is an uncomfortable passage for a great many individuals. But we need to understand that Peter's command is prefaced by all this as follows. Love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. We know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. And then Peter adds the command. Here is the focus point. It is the word love. Love one another fervently. It is the Greek word agapao, and this is a command. And it means to love as God loves, to love deliberately, to love unilaterally, to love unconditionally. The ability to love our brethren is a part of the saving work of Christ. But again, we must choose to act upon that. We must choose to commit ourselves to loving the brethren. Notice what Paul, Peter writes concerning that. We are to love them fervently. We're to love them passionately. And secondly, we are to love them with a pure heart. This is not the hypocritical heart of loving one and not another. This is the true heart, the pure heart that loves passionately. And it must be done with the help and the assistance of God. We need to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit if we are, in fact, to love the brethren fervently and to love them with a pure heart because they, like us, are imperfect. Again, Peter explains how we are able to do this. And it's quite simply found in this phrase. We have been born again by incorruptible seed through the Word of God. The agency here is God's eternal Word. We've been born again. It's the Greek word agonao. And the interesting thing is, this word is only found in this verse in 1 Peter. It's unique to Peter, but it expresses the spiritual rebirth of which Jesus spoke to Nicodemus. Understand, Nicodemus, you must be born again. This is that spiritual rebirth. This is being made alive through faith in Christ. This is being quickened by the Holy Spirit. And Peter brings one final contrast at this point as he draws this section to a close where he refers back to the short stay that we have on this earth. Again, 
We're the paroikas. We're the sojourners. We're the outsiders living in a world that is very different than we would have it to be. And this is in 1 Peter 1, verse 24. We are to live godly lives because all flesh is as grass. All the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Our life is short. It's but a moment. In numerous places, the Bible tells us it's like the grass that rises up in the morning and withers under the noonday sun. It's the flower that blooms and then falls away. Our life is short, but eternity is forever. Our time here is brief, especially in light of the fact that God has ordained that we who have put our faith in Christ will be with him for all of eternity. And knowing that, I borrow a phrase from uh, Peter Schaeffer. How then shall we live before a holy God who judges a man's life by his works? Now, that judgment specifically is not in regard to our souls. Our souls have been quickened, made alive, and are kept by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. But our lives are judged for rewards. And when we come to the Bema Seat of Christ, when we stand before the one who shed his blood for us, who valued us more than his own life, who is willing to set aside all of the glory and the honor of heaven to come in the form of a man, to live a life just as we live, to suffer and bleed and die. In light of all of that, how shall we live in this world ever so briefly, knowing that we will live with him for eternity? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Peter. And as we think of this ending of the phrase, that this is the gospel that was preached to you, we're reminded that Peter preached the first sermon at Pentecost. He preached the gospel to an unwilling and unbelieving generation, and multitudes received Christ as Lord and Savior. Father, now help us as we consider the things that Peter has written for us, how important it is to live for Christ and as Christ in this world, knowing that he willingly gave himself for us. And we thank you and praise you, dear God, for all that you have in store for us that will be revealed when Christ returns to take us away, to take us home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.